Hi everyone, welcome to the Yam Podcast. My name is Nala Hachman. We are super excited to welcome you back to another expert slash bliss video. We got a bit of a remix in the building. Josh Patton is an amazing entrepreneur that started a business on microgreens and is kind of like an expert in the field as well. So we didn't know where to place him because he's in so many amazing categories. This podcast is super educational. To me, at least, it was really new to learn about microgreens, how to grow them, what they are, how they're good for you. So we're hoping that this is a bit of a knowledge series for you. And hopefully you can add a little bit of greens to your life and also sneak a couple microgreens in your kids donuts or muffins or bagels so that they can get some healthy nutrients. I will include some of the recipes that Josh's wife makes, Zareen Patton, in episode three. If you've heard of her before, if you haven't watched that episode, you definitely need to. And yeah, you'll be able to make your own microgreens recipes at home. Super excited to start and let's go. Hi everyone, welcome to the Yam Podcast. My name is Nal Hachbin. I am the host, and today we have a very special guest, Joshua Patton. Welcome, Joshua. Josh is a family member. Let's just get clear on family relations here. So Josh is my sister-in-law's brother-in-law. Said in another way, it is he is my sister-in-law's sister's husband. Let's see if that's like a brain twister for people. So welcome, Josh. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm excited to to get on here and uh, have a conversation. I've been watching your stuff and following you for a while. And you had that podcast with Zareen as well. And yeah. So- Zareen is Josh's wife. So everyone heard her speak before. And yeah, there's so much I want to talk to you about today. And so why I wanted to invite Josh over is really to actually, he's like our guest expert like speaker, because what he has to say about like microgreens is like so intense and important. And it's, this is like a cross between an expert and a bliss series. Like you get like both categories on the Yam podcast, because what you have to say is so important for the mommies to know. And I don't really think a lot of people know what microgreens are. So let's start there. But then also I didn't mention this you also started your own business and your own company, like working with microgreens, but let's start from the beginning. So what are microgreens for people who don't know? So for folks who don't know, normally when you plant like veggies, you have the seeds and then they grow up into sprouts. And then from sprouts, they grow into microgreens. And then from greens, they're like microgreens become baby greens and whatnot from that. So microgreens are just very young plants. They're very young vegetables, usually about 10 to 11 days old, or I should say nine to 11 days old. Some of them takes a little bit longer depending on the variety, but they're the edible shoots of vegetables and people eat them when they are super, super small, when they're that young, because at the microgreen stage of growth, they're about to grow their true leaves. That means they're about to grow into their full, like regular plant and start to become the plant that they will eventually grow into. And so they're gathering all of the nutrients, all the minerals, they're gathering all of their potential so that they can become that beautiful plant that provides a full vegetable, like a red cabbage or a broccoli or a radish or whatever. But before they start growing much bigger, they have all of that potential and we harvest that potential and we benefit by eating that. And and so many different varieties of microgreens have many times more the nutritional value of the full grown plant. So for example, radish microgreens is considered 40 times more nutritious than a full grown radish. So if I have one bite of radish microgreens, it's like I'm eating 40 bites of radish, regular radish, minus the fiber, obviously, because when you eat 40 bites of 
radish, you're going to be getting a lot of fiber. Fiber, like it's really just your body's breaking the fiber down and trying to actually eliminate it. So it uses a lot of energy to do that elimination process. But mm. with a microgreen, it just absorbs all the good stuff and yeah. doesn't yeah, use yeah. much energy. Yeah. And with microgreens, you don't, there's a couple of things with that. You don't generally replace your diet with microgreens, right? You're like you're adding them to your diet, either as a garnish or you're putting it in smoothies or in salads or sandwiches or whatever. And so it's a, it's an addition, it's a supplement. And so you still get all of those other good things like fiber and things from whatever else you're eating. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're blowing my mind here. This is not what I thought microgreens were at all. I was thinking about it like herbs. Like it's like a totally hmm. different plant, but I didn't, I was not aware that microgreens yeah. are literally just the baby people, versions people of even, like straight up vegetables. Yes, definitely. And people even make grow herb varieties of microgreens. So there's popular ones are like uh, micro cilantro. Sometimes people grow micro basil or sometimes people will grow like micro, what is the one? Green onions and things like that. Just the real small varieties, but they... Or chives, that's the one that, that people often grow as chives too, but they take a little longer to grow. Like my business is like shorter growing periods. The only one that I grow that's a little bit more challenging that I hate growing just because <laughs> it's so difficult is wheat grasses. Yeah. It's a grass. Yeah. But technically like every single blade of this grass will grow into a stalk that will grow wheat on it, but it's, it's gluten-free. It doesn't have the actual pods or whatever they are that the wheat comes from the fruit of the mm. plant, so to say, but yeah. And wheat grass is so, so good though. I bet that's like why it's so healthy for people. That's why I bet you grow it even with all this like yeah. difficulty. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, so, for so sure. I grow it. I sell it to a couple places. Like I sell it to a local juice place and then I sell a couple people locally and it's considered by nutritionists to have every vitamin and mineral necessary for human nutrition. So wow. it's, it's like packs a huge punch. Yeah. People do shots, wheatgrass shots. All yeah. The time. That's what they, yeah. So you don't have to do more than just like shots. Oh, sorry. You don't really need to do more than just a shot. That's how much nutrients uh, like it's packed. Yeah. It's a lot. I don't know exactly what the ratios of different nutrients and vitamins are, but I don't often, if I do know people that use wheatgrass often they they will do just one shot a day or something like that or they might mix it into a smoothie or something like that but they won't normally do a, a huge amount because you have to imagine if i have one bite of radish and i'm having 40 bites and that is equivalent to 40 bites of regular radish like how much radish do i really need in my life radish <laughs> microgreens the benefits of radish as a plant in general it's good for your immune system it's useful for your heart and there's like, it's associated with heart health as well. And mm -hmm. so like, if people are really into some of those health benefits, mm -hmm. they might want a lot of it. And if people are taking mm -hmm. microgreens as a replacement for like, a, a, I don't know, therapeutically, if they're taking it medicinally to, to give them something that they really need, then they might take larger amounts. I wanted to actually just pause here to share a little yeah. fun fact that you shared that like radishes are good for the heart. So radish sure. is a pink color, right? Like mm -hmm. one variety of it's pink. That's actually why, and yam, as in the yam podcast, yam is actually a seed sound for the heart. And that's actually the reason why our entire brand is pink in color is because it's talking about things that are of the heart. So it's like the universal like love that you must have for the world. You love your family at your sit bones. You love your lovers at your like where your reproductive organs are, like below your navel. But then you're supposed to love everyone else from your heart. And things that we talk about on the Yam podcast are all about the heart. So it's fun mm. fact. It's like any color of vegetable that is a certain thing. Also, wheatgrass is green. Actually, the only chakra in the body that has two colors is the heart chakra. So it's pink and mm. green. So Yam, mm. Yoga Avic Ma could have been either green or pink which is, it's mostly pink, but we also have the Bicentenary Meditation Project, which is green, dark green, like green. wheatgrass. Yeah. So it's like all these things are like, it's not random that you say radishes yeah. are good for the heart. Cause like literally yeah. any color of a vegetable actually nourishes that specific chakra. Probably we'll yeah. get into that at, at a future well, podcast. Any of these, 
any vegetable or anything that's like dark in color, they generally have a lot of antioxidants, a lot of carotenes. And those are obviously associated with like detoxing your body and associated with lymphatic system health, which is your the detox lymph nodes that soak up body. the body. Exactly. And for example, the we also grow red cabbage microgreens. And that one is especially associated with health, heart health. And the reason mm-hmm. why it's associated with heart health so much is because there's just a lot of beta carotene, like it's 260 times the beta carotene of a full grown red cabbage in the microgreens. So is red cabbage like, like purple cabbage is purple in color, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, okay. like the, it's like the purple one. Yeah. Like so sauerkraut. The red cabbage. The pro, yeah. If that's the one, the cabbage that they use in sauerkraut. Yeah. And the red cabbage is like purple. It says called red cabbage, but it's like a beautiful purple color. Yeah. In the microgreen form, it grows just like a couple inches tall. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's like really mild. It's also associated with immune system health because it's got a ton of vitamin C in it. But just what you were saying about dark colors, we also recognize that. In, and it doesn't have to be in microgreens form. Obviously, like any plant, if you eat a regular red cabbage, it has a lot of carotenes, beta carotenes because of those colors. And same with darker greens and things like that as well, for sure. So why wouldn't we just straight up eat microgreens? Is it just like that wouldn't be enough food for us to like fuel us? It would be enough nutrients, but it wouldn't be enough like energy. Yeah. Actually, that's the other thing that I forgot about mentioning was microgreens are often associated with weight loss, Mm. not because they, I think some of them actually do encourage our digestive system and the way that we absorb nutrients and the way that we excrete nutrient waste and things like that. But specifically the fact that there is just such a low calorie Per mm-hmm. to nutrient ratio. So you have just a small calories for a huge amount of nutrients. So you don't need, if you need, I don't know, a certain amount of like a hundred grams of this particular nutrient, and you get all of that in a small amount from the microgreens versus a large amount from the full grown plant, then you're eating less. And so in that way, they consider that to be beneficial for weight loss, but our bodies do need a certain number of calories to survive. So that's, I think probably why people don't generally just subsist off of microgreens. You might in an emergency, like just have microgreens and you'd probably be fine. Yeah. But there (laughs) there is the calorie intake that you'd need. I do have microgreen salads. I'll just have a mix. Like I have a couple of mixes that I sell. And so I'll just have all of those mixes and I'll just eat it up for one, one meal, but then we'll also do other things like smoothies and stuff in the morning. And then I'll have microgreens as a garnish on something. So all throughout the day, I'm eating microgreens in different ways and it's up to people's needs. And yeah. So I went to a functional therapist before, which a nutritionist, functional nutritionist. So it's basically they're like all around like nutritionists. And she was explaining mm-hmm. to me how in the 1950s, if you had a bowl of spinach, you would get your amount of iron that you needed to ingest. Whereas now you need like 48 bowls of iron of spinach to get the same amount of iron in your body because of the like depletion of the soil. So I'm just like wondering Mm. is like, since microgreens still have that pack, I don't know whether or not this is advised to actually like, just that would make sense to me now that I'm hearing this, that actually maybe eating like microgreens would retain some of that nutrients, a micronutrients that you would need. So I, I don't know if micro spinach like exists, but I would assume oh, that yeah. would, it does. Yeah, so- but, uh, it's not as popular a variety. I think it takes a little bit longer to grow. And I also think it's not necessarily like a, like for example, radish or even broccoli, they're considered broccoli is also considered 40 times more nutritious than the full grown plant. Whereas micro spinach, I don't think is considered like that huge of a, okay. of a nutrient dense plant versus the full grown plant. That's my understanding. But yeah, you definitely could um, subsidize some of your like nutritional needs with microgreens. You have your spinach in your salad. And then on top of that, you throw on whatever else you want to add that's as a microgreen and you get a big boost of whatever nutrients you need. And if you're looking for iron, like fenugreek has a ton of iron. Peas have a lot, like we do pea shoots as well. Pea shoots that are they're quite large. They have a lot of iron in them. Actually, all the varieties that we grow do have quite a lot of iron in them, but yeah. I'm torn between asking you 
how let's start with this one. So how with all the plants, like, give me like an hourly or which plant grows the fastest and then which mm-hmm. one is second or third and like each sure. one, tell us a little bit about the benefits of it. Sure. So peas, the, uh, so I don't grow all the varieties of microgreens. There are some businesses that you go to their website, they've got like 40 different varieties of microgreens that they potentially could grow for you. Yeah. And I'm like, I would never want to do that. <laughs> <It's just laughs> so much stuff, but, but yeah, so we grow six varieties of microgreens and then wheatgrass as well. So of the ones that we grow, peas are the fastest growing. So I put them in the last, when I start germinating everything, they're the last ones to germinate and they grow fairly large. So if I grow them for too long, then they'll, there's like a perfect window of how long they are. When they get too long, they're like a little bit stringy. When they grow too short, they're not as, there's not enough weight to them. But anyway, so peas are associated with protein. They're associated with iron and immune system health. And then after peas, in terms of speed of growth, I would say probably the radish is the next fastest growing. So we also start that one a little bit later. And that was associated, we talked about that one already, associated with immune system health, with heart health, and it's considered 40 times more nutritious Mm. than the full grown radish. After that would probably be, probably the fenugreek, probably fenugreek, broccoli, and red cabbage grows at a similar rate. And they might take 10 days. So the others might take nine days. Those ones might take about 10 days to grow. And those ones are, all of them are associated with immune system health. The so fenugreek specifically is associated with lymphatic system health, and it's got a lot of antioxidants in it. It's associated with breast health, especially, and a lot of people will take it for helping with lactation. And so as your sister-in-law, my sister-in-law, she uses fenugreek microgreens when we were able to give them to her and she enjoys them. They help her with lactation. Like it gives her more milk? Yeah. Yeah. It helps mm. produce more milk. And, uh, and she said she's noticed a difference. And I know we, we were, we had our kids before we knew about microgreens. And so we were having fenugreek supplements when we, our kids were nursing and we noticed the difference. And so fenugreek microgreens obviously also produce that same, that same function. They also have a lot of protein in them. And so I actually include them in my protein mix. Nice. One of the mixes I've got peas, fenugreek and broccoli because broccoli has also got lots of protein. Fenugreek is also really high in, in iron and it has a lot of something called folic acid. Actually, a lot of the different microgreens have folic acid in them. Interesting. That's a, really a good. The ones folic, that I grow. Yeah. Folic acid is usually the thing that doctors prescribe to women when they're doing their family planning. They yeah. give them like, because it's actually something I learned this in university where if you At the beginning stages, when the embryo is growing, if they don't have folic acid, what can happen is that their spine actually ends up like protruding out of their body. So it's actually Mm -hmm. very important. This is why they always say that like really plan to have babies and plan to have children so that you can go to your doctor beforehand and actually get the essential nutrients that you need in your body. Folic acid is actually, at least at when we learned it, it's like, it's not in people's common diets because it's probably because we were not eating microgreens back then. I mean, it's in the full grown plants, maybe not to like in, in the same density as it would be in a microgreen. Mm-hmm. I also think like we, you were talking about how spinach today, it takes us to, we eat a lot more of it to get the same amount of nutrients. Yeah. Part of that is soil health. Exactly. Another part of that is that we've cultivated the varieties of food that we eat, we've cultivated them over the course of the past hundreds of years, thousands of years to be more palatable and also Mm. to be able to grow maybe more to our liking. Maybe they're larger, maybe they're grow faster. We've cultivated plants. And as we've cultivated these plants, we've cultivated some of the nutrients out of them. Think about sweet corn, for example, sweet corn is not the way that it's intended to be like sweet I don't know. We grow different varieties of apples and they're great to eat, but this variety of apple versus that variety of apple, you're going to get vastly different nutrients in each of them because some of them just don't have a lot of nutrients. They're made to be sweet or they're made to be packaged and sent around the world and last for a super long time. 
I'm just thinking anyway. the, only, the only example that I know that people recommend putting in smoothies for apples, it's like the green apples. That's the mm. one that's, it's sour. It's not like as sweet as the other one. So I'm guessing yeah. that maybe like apples ones. were actually never sweet <laughs> before, but they, they became- were more tart. I think you're right. And actually, in the, at least in the United States, the apple industry, I think maybe two or 300 years ago, that the apple industry was focused on cider and making apples mm. into juices and not yeah. make, not eat. It wasn't like big into people actually eating apples just as they are. Oh, It was, that was the whole industry was more like that, but it changed over time. But to get back to folic acid, you're absolutely right. It's associated with like spine development, spinal development. And then my wife, she also mentioned that it's, it's supposed to be good for brain development hmm. um, in the, in the well, fetus. The whole so central nervous system. Folic acid. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, and those are the first things that grow in a baby is the brain and the, the cent- spine and yeah. the central nervous system. Yeah. And that's like in yoga, it basically, the motto is you have a healthy spine, you have a healthy life. That's why basically mm. in yoga, all the asanas, the physical yoga postures are really just to make your spine malleable. If you think of even animals, like a vertebrae, like a cat, like when it stretches and yawns, like you can see like the arch of its spine or yeah. like how it moves or how it falls. And it can always catch itself based off of like the twisting of the spine. And so it's interesting how the first few like organs that develop in our body is connected with the spinal cord. And so hmm. spinal health is yeah. huge in yoga. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more. Was there a couple more like with cabbage and, and the other one that you want to wheatgrass? Broccoli, oh, broccoli. We- yeah. So with broccoli, like I said earlier, it was, it's considered 40 times more nutritious than a full grown broccoli. I used to tell people that broccoli is like the queen of the microgreens. And I still think that like broccoli has Why? the most research, oh, uh, medical research that suggests that it's got lots of different health benefits. So when I, whenever I talk about health benefits of microgreens, I always try to use certain wording because I'm not a doctor and because the medical research related to microgreens is fairly new. And also the research is based mostly on, it's mostly animal research. Like what has this done to animals and how has Mm -hmm. it affected them? And so they've learned that broccoli is associated with cancer prevention. Oh wow! That's probably one of the, one of the main things that broccoli microgreens are used for medicinally, even though it's got many other benefits, like it's considered a good for your immune system. It's considered good for your heart. It's considered an anti-inflammatory, but the biggest one is cancer prevention because it has a particular chemical called sulforaphane. Sulforaphane, it's the highest, actually broccoli microgreens are the highest sulforaphane producing plant of any plant. Um, and this chemical, so is associated with cancer prevention because of the way it, it protects us from cancer cells. And, and there are whole businesses, microgreens businesses that center completely on just broccoli. Wow. Uh, And they, like one of these businesses in Vancouver, I think it's in Vancouver in Canada, they grow broccoli microgreens and they dry them and they sell them as powder, as a powder that you add to food or drinks or whatever, but you are able to use it medicinally in that way. That's so Um, interesting because actually I speak to an intuitive healer and she says that broccoli doesn't work with my body. She actually said anything that is sprout, anything that sprouts doesn't work with my body. But now I'm like, just as you're speaking, I'm just like, maybe I can't eat the like full grown broccoli when it sprouts, but maybe I can eat the baby ones. But I'm just wondering, like maybe the baby ones are actually still a sprout. Cause like for it to even come out, that's the sprout. No. Yeah. I know that some people have some issues with sprouts. Some people have issues with cruciferous vegetables as well. Yeah. Like broccoli. I've had customers who come to me and talk to me about, they are actually not able to digest or they're not able to eat like the red cabbage or the broccoli because it's not good for their body. Yeah. You um, mean the grown, yeah. like full grown, like no, any or like uh, even the vegetable, but even the microgreens. I'm not too? sure. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know for sure. They haven't bought the microgreens from me because of that. They know okay. that. And so they tell me, or they think oh. that the microgreens as well. So I don't know what the difference is and I don't know why people can't have 
what why people get allergic to cruciferous mm. vegetables or why they're not able to digest them or whatever. But there's there, there might be several reasons. Like I even have some customers who say they can't have wheatgrass because they're allergic to wheat. And I tell them it doesn't have any gluten in it. Yeah. But they say, I understand that, but I'm actually allergic to the wheat plant, not oh. just the wheat, like as in what they use for bread, but the wheat, the whole plant itself. Oh. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's very interesting. So I don't know. I, there's a lot to be learned about it. And microgreens have been around for a long time. In some parts of the world, they've been, especially fenugreek has been used in India for, I think, a couple thousand years. They use it um, for a lot of beauty products too. And like teas, like I know yes, uh, yeah. a YouTuber that Ma- I really Mayfi, like. I think really watching Roddy, yeah. she uses it in her morning teas, like all the time. It's like fenugreek, fennel. I think it's maybe it's fennel. It's not fenugreek. Wait, what's the difference? <laughs> I actually fennel don't know. Is the one that sort of tastes a little bit like licorice. So fennel might be the one that she's having in her teas, but got it. you can just do the same with fenugreek. And I'm sure people do use fenugreek. I don't know, maybe full grown fenugreek or microgreens fenugreek in in like teas and things like that. I know we could probably dry it out and use it in that way. And there are some businesses that dry microgreens out and make them as seasonings. Like they make radish microgreens seasoning, which is Mm -hmm. like a, like in a shaker. Yeah. Um, That's actually what I made. I made like the reason why I know fenugreek. It's actually fennel. I think it's fennel. Fennel is the Krish one. Yeah. It's fennel where I would make it like in, in seed mix. Like I put fennel, I would put niala seeds. I don't know if you've Mm. heard of that before. It's like onion. I think it's onion seeds. Oh, It's like black and it's, and then there's poppy seeds. So these three seeds, like fennel, Mm. niala seeds and poppy seeds, three. So you eat the seeds. Yeah. And I sprinkle it on my salads. So yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You can get a lot of benefits, a lot of health benefits from seeds. A lot of people are really into chia seeds too, right? Yeah. And the thing with sprouts and microgreens is as soon as you take a seed and you start to sprout it immediately, its nutritional value grows exponentially. And so that's why people really love the benefits of sprouts and microgreens, because as soon as you start sprouting it, the plant starts metabolizing all of its latent potential minerals and nutrients. It starts metabolizing them and getting ready to grow into Mm -hmm. a full grown plant. So it starts using what it has around it to get itself to that point. Actually, and, uh, after having heard you say that, like, I'm guessing that like maybe even the baby micrograins of broccoli wouldn't work, but the seeds of broccoli might, but I don't know if people eat the seeds of broccoli but based off of what you know. just said, because if a seed like grows, then that's the sprout. It's already sprouted. So it's like, maybe if it was just a seed or something like that, I don't know if the nutrients sure. or anything like that would be even helpful. Like the seed sure, might maybe. not be like cancer prevention or anything like that. So how did you get into all this? Like, what was the start of like first learning about it and then actually yeah. going into it as a business? And- it's a little bit of a weird sort of route to get to microgreens. Like we I had a job and I, it was a bit stressful and it was coming home from this job. I felt like I didn't have the emotional bandwidth. bank account. Yeah. Bandwidth to, <laughs> to really give to my family. And so that was the thing that, that made us start to look into what else can we do in mm-hmm. working at this job. And one of the things that I'd been interested in for a while was urban agriculture and just getting involved and thinking about food security. And and that for me was very connected to community and doing something that I could see the results. I could produce something and I could physically see it it giving to someone that I was in my neighborhood, was in my community. So Mm. I wanted to have an impact on the lives of people in my neighborhood, the lives of people in my community. Mm. And I thought community or I thought urban agriculture could be the method for doing that. And so that's where I went with that. I started looking into different things that we could do, but we also recognized that it takes a few years to get businesses like this to be profitable or to Mm. get businesses like this to be really beneficial and build it up. And so microgreens I'd seen in several businesses, they are actually very profitable because they're, they're more of a niche thing and they're more expensive than a regular vegetable. And- so just hold up for a second. I know a little bit about your previous job and things like that. I'm just trying to connect it back to like food security. 
was like one of the reasons I know like you were helping like a lot of underprivileged children or children in like very difficult circumstances. And I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but would you go to school and that, that they wouldn't have food? Like food was like they, or they didn't have, they didn't bring home lunch or to school. And that was like one of the issues. That's how it got you thinking about like food security and stuff. I think that was part of it. Definitely. And also the pandemic and people losing their jobs. Mm. And there was a real issue with food security and people Mm. not getting what they needed with my old job. Actually, I still work for them part-time now, but basically it's a using theater and theater education and those types of skills to teach social and emotional learning and literacy skills. And we would do that generally in in communities where there's populations of underserved children. And so almost all of them, probably 100% or close to 100% of them would be on free or reduced lunches. Mm -hmm. And so normally they'd come and have their breakfast at the school and then they'd have a lunch at the school. And even every month or so, there'd be like a little market where they'd have fresh vegetables and fruits and stuff Mm -hmm. that families could come and take. Yeah. So food security is an issue. It's weird to say like people from around the world might be like, oh, in the United States, there's food insecurity. Anyway. Yeah. So where we're going with it now is definitely food security is a big thing. And actually microgreens are so easy to grow that a lot of people can grow them in their homes with very limited effort. Yeah. So tell us, let's go into that. Cause I think that if people like hear this podcast then they're going to, some might want to actually do this. So you have zero Persian blood in you, but this is quite a Persian (laughs) thing to grow your own herbs in your house. It's like in my blood. Like I, (laughs) I realized that one of the things that I just kept like watching my mom do is like growing her herbs. She grows like mint, nobody's business. Like mint loves her. It's an easy, it's an easy one to grow. Right now I'm yeah. growing like mint, basil and rosemary. And the only thing that is surviving is my mint. The rest are all dying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Oh, so tell I mean, us- they're all difficult to grow. Yeah. <clears throat> so tell us how to, how do you grow things or like, how do you grow it? It's not like you have like, a farm or like a shed or something like this. You're growing this like in your basement, right? <laughs> yeah. In our basement. Yeah. You could do it in a shed. You could do it in like a greenhouse. A lot of people have greenhouse sort of growing operations, but there's also a lot of people who do like the sort of vertical farming method. Mm-hmm. They have like shelves with lights and they grow it indoors in some sort of space that they dedicate to that type. So of that's growth. what you do, right? Yeah. That's what we do. And it's fairly simple. We started out with a couple of trays that we filled with some soil, Mm -hmm. any soil, really. You don't really have to have any fertilizer Mm -hmm. or you don't need to have anything that has like miracle grow or anything. It could just be like, in fact, it's probably better to have something that's very neutral and sterile. That way you can add to it. If you do want to add something, you can, uh, but you don't need to. So we just take some soil in a tray and make sure it's nice and moist. And then you sprinkle your seeds, depending on the side of the tr- size of the tray, you put a different type of density of seeds in there. And so you sprinkle your seeds on there and then you cover the tray with another tray and then a weight. So mm-hmm. the way that I'll do it is normally I'll have several trays going at once. So just this morning, I made six trays of wheatgrass. So each tray I stack on top of the tray below it. So Mm -hmm. I have six trays stacked. And then the very top one, I put an empty tray with a brick. And that weight simulates the sort of weight of the earth, the weight of soil on top of the seed. And Mm -hmm. so what it does is it forces, as the seed starts to sprout, it forces the roots downward, which is good. You want the roots to grow first. So it forces the roots downward. And then once the roots go further south, they go down enough, then they start to, it also starts to sprout up. So once you've planted all the seeds, do you put more soil on top of it or no, you just pat it down, make it submerged or is it supposed to, I put the soil, I pat it down, then I moisten it and get everything moist. Then I put the seeds on top and I'll spray a little bit on top, spray a little bit of water on top of that. And then I'll just pop the next tray right on top of it. So no more soil, nothing on top. And what happens after about three days is it depends on the variety. Usually it's anywhere from between two and a half to maybe three and a half 
four days, the seeds will start to sprout. And because there's so many of them on one tray, they'll start to push up and mm-hmm. the whole tray above them, all the trees above them will start to move up because they're all pushing together. It's really cool to see the strength of these plants and the whole stack will start to like grow and start tilting to the side. Wow. Yeah. But if I was, at, well, okay. Then you take the tray after you can tell that they're germinating and do you have to like constantly the, water them like every couple of days? You no. Know, when they're germinating, you don't need to water them at all. After about three days or so, when you see that they're pushing up on the trays above them, then you take them out and you put them under the lights. Then you water them and you're probably going to water them. Probably you're going to water them every day, but really you just want to make sure that the soil is not dried out. The soil needs to be moist. You need to see that it's like nice and dark and moist, but it doesn't have to be, you don't want it to be soaking wet and you definitely don't want it to be dry. And well, also actually, remind me. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, I was going to say in some cases with some varieties, if you do dry them out and mm. they all wilt, when you water them again, they'll come back up and actually they'll get this beautiful darker color. And they'll, in some cases they'll get different flavors or they'll be more crunchy when you mm. let them do that. And it's an interesting thing someone was telling me about that, this idea of how people talk about cutting plants back in yeah. the fall or in the spring yeah. and how that helps them to grow and bloom the next mm-hmm. time. It's Pruning a similar them, essentially. idea. Exactly. Is mm-hmm. that when you're, when you let these plants wilt a little bit and then they come back, they come back much stronger wow. because they've gone through this adversity, mm. they've gone through some challenge. Mm. And so when they come back stronger, so the sunflower, I grew sunflower microgreens too. And we didn't talk about all, at all no. about that, but the sunflower microgreens, they're richer, they're nuttier, they're crunchier, and they have this dark red stem mm. when they do that. When they don't do that, they don't have the same characteristics. It's interesting. That's such an anyway, amazing yeah. metaphor for life in general. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Even if you will, just this morning, I was just like reflecting on like a personal challenge that I'm going through and I'm just like, Ugh, this life is so hard. This life is just so challenging at some times and it can really beat you down. And honestly, that analogy that you just provided was like gold. That was really, (laughs) and it's funny that I actually took, I just, I got a Hafez poem after this and the Hafez poem was saying the same thing that great suffering people who are like great, the great saints have all suffered like greatly. So big suffering equals great, greater rewards. And I know this in yoga, like as well, one of my teachers in my training programs was like saying how happiness is not, if you want to experience more happiness, you have to experience more pain because it's like a spectrum that goes outwards, like on both ends. So if you're willing to experience more pain, then you're then you have more joy. But a lot of people cannot feel or cannot get to this greater sense of joy because they're not willing to go through this pain. And if we just use this analogy of the microgreens and learn from these baby little plants, like that actually, if you let them wilt and then to bring them back to life, then you test its strength. That's like genius. Like that's even in the (laughs) microest bits of our lives, like that same reflection is like given. And just so you know, FYI, I don't know if you knew this, but Nahal means sapling. So when I think about mm. microgreens, I think it's like a bunch of like little Nahals. Like- it is. It's a bunch of Nahals. Yeah. <laughs> but Nahal is actually a tree, not plant, but actually it's supposed to be a tree, but I think it's actually before it's like a full grown tree. It's like a sprout. It's like a sprouted little mm. microgreen. Yeah. And <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just like That's a little funny. microgreen. So yeah, That's definitely funny. that all needs to wilt. And because I was always like, why did my parents like name me like such a like pansy name? Like, why not like a big cypress tree or something like that? But I was trying to make meaning of my own name. And I was like thinking that, oh, if I'm a nahal, if I'm a small plant, if I'm a small sapling, then that means that I have to continuously grow. I have to continuously mm. strive. I have to continuously, like, there's no end to my growth because a little baby sprout, a little baby microgreen, all it wants to do is grow into a big one, grow into its like full potential. Even though we just learned that little microgreens have like amazing, but way more potential (laughs) than the bigger ones. (laughs) Maybe that part of the analogy is not coherent, but we'll just leave it at that. But yeah, yeah. what I was going to ask you is like, why do you need the lights? 
And if people were to do this at home, like I was following you up until the point of the lights. And then I was like, oh, where am I going to get the lights or what kind of lights are these that we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. So there's two ways of doing it. LEDs, all of our lights are LEDs. LEDs are cheap. Mm -hmm. You do not need expensive LEDs to grow microgreens. The quality of the lights you have, the temperature of your growing space, the humidity in your growing space, all of these are going to affect the rate of growth. People testing things out, see how long it takes you. See how long when I change this variable, when I change that variable, play around with it. You very well can use these lights. You can be successful with microgreens. So the purpose of these LEDs are to mimic like sunlight, right? Because these are like in the basement, there's no light down there. And so you put the lights so that they can mimic like lights, rays of the sun. And And yet you don't need like expensive ones because basically the microgreens and any plants that are just vegetative, they're just, they're at that stage of growth. It's not, they don't fruit or they don't flower. They're before that. And it's just greens. You can grow in certain spectrums of light. They do better with like red and blue light spectrums. Mm. So a lot of growers will have this sort of purpley pinkish lights and that's all they'll use. And that's perfectly fine. Uh, Mm. You don't have to do that, obviously. Yeah. I remember seeing some of the photos on your Instagram, which is actually, what's the handlebar so that everyone knows it? Yeah, it's one garden greens at one garden greens at one garden greens. Yeah. It's really cool to actually see the process sometimes. Like I enjoy the behind the scenes, like shots. Yeah, it's cool. It's fun to do. And really when we started out, we did not have lights when we started out, when I mean, starting out, we just testing things out your brother. We did it at your brother's house Nice. and in his window with sunlight. Yeah. And it was fine. And you don't need a special tray. You don't need Mm. special soil. You don't need special anything. You don't need special lights. You just need a pot or a bowl or some sort of vessel that you can put soil into any soil. I think Mm. we used some garden soil when we started out. And you You just just went in your backyard to just get some soil. in. I think Nia's Nia's tried that (laughs) actually garden soil from his garden, but also just soil that was extra soil in gardening bags, like stuff we were going to add to our garden. But yeah, soil, get it wet, put whatever seeds on and then put it in front of actually do the germination. So having some sort of weight on it for a couple days and then just putting it in front of the sunny window. And even if you don't have direct sunlight, it'll probably still work. It might not have the same qualities as if it were to grow in direct sunlight, but, and it might take a little bit longer to grow. Like mm-hmm. instead of 10 days, it might take 14 days or, yeah. or something like that. I don't know. It's the, all of these things are things to test and to try out and it might taste different here. It might taste different there. It might yeah. have different color or different consistency, but it's so funny that you talk about this weight because I'm just thinking again, another analogy of life, how amazing yeah. it is that I would think that it's so counterintuitive. You're trying to grow these like green, like leafy sprouts that come out and then yet you're putting weight on it. Like that would be counterintuitive for me, but then you need to mimic the force of gravity Mm. where the force of gravity is often, at least in yoga, it is known as like the power of God. That is Mm. like the thing that like allows things to grow for seeds to grow, like the force that allows that. So it's funny. It's just beautiful to see. It's not funny. It's just like amazing to see the coherence in everything. Like in the plants, right. like in the beginning, just like when you grow it, like there's so many analogies that you can learn in life <laughs> just yeah, by growing microgreens sure. like itself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Those roots that they're putting down, that's the whole purpose of that weight is really so that they focus their growth downwards first, because they have something that's soft that they can push their roots down into. And, uh, and without roots, we can't stand, we can't grow without first having that foundation, that strong foundation. And um, so it's true for the microgreens, it's true for us. And really, if you do try to grow without weight, it's possible. If you don't put the weight on there, it definitely is possible. Although I've heard that if you do that, then the microgreens can fall over and they, because they won't have that strong root, they might just spread their root systems out to shallow mm. on the top of the soil. Yeah. And so then they won't be able to really grow properly. If they don't have a nice deep system of roots, like you'll survive, but you won't feel stable or if the winds were to blow. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So tell us a little bit about like, 
also on your Instagram page and on your Facebook page, there are so many beautiful photos of food of like recipes of, I saw one, one photo of like a chocolate muffin or something like that. And you said you Mm. would never know that there's actually microgreens in there. So you like sneak little microgreens in for your babies to eat, right? If they're not going to, if they're not willing to eat anything green. Yeah. Yeah. That's almost entirely Zareen. My wife's doing is, is the way that she uses microgreens in the cooking. And you can, because they can be, you can replace any type of greens, like leafy greens with microgreens, you can put them in a lot of different things. So sandwiches and salads and smoothies and whatever else, but they also make a really great garnish. So we'll garnish them on top of like omelets or we'll garnish them on top of a pasta dish or even a rice dish, whatever it is, just as a nice garnish, it adds a lot of nutrients. Like a bagel. Um, That's one photo yeah, that I just bagel, remember yeah. seared in my mind. It's so yeah. good. I'm like, I want to eat yeah, that she'll, bagel she'll so bad. Bake them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a good bagel too with the sunflower microgreens. And we'll put them into, she'll put them into dinner biscuits sometimes. Those are like the kind of scones or like the like desserts. Um, That's like where that. I was like, or oh, desserts. this is very see, smart. Yeah. This is very smart for people who <laughs> like don't eat it or especially for kids, because a lot of our listeners are going to be moms and they might be like fretting over like the anxiety of their kids not getting enough nutrition and like sneaking in like microgreens in like muffins or things like that, or just knowing that other children like eat microgreen muffins, like I think would be yeah, just sure. like a huge comfort for them. Yeah. And you've probably, people have heard of zucchini bread, like people who cut up zucchini and they'll put it into a muffin or they'll put it into some sort of bread. It's a very common thing. And we do that with microgreens. We do use them in some baking. Obviously when you cook vegetables, it, some of the nutrients are lost. You cook mm-hmm. out some of the nutrients. So we almost always try to eat microgreens raw, raw, or at least use them in such a way that we're not heating them and mm-hmm. cooking them. So like in a smoothie is fine. Mm. You get all the full benefit of the microgreens when they're in a smoothie. And, and actually, kids don't we, see that. Yeah. So it's easy. Yeah, the to- kids don't see that. And my youngest daughter, she's three years old. She will drink a microgreen smoothie every morning. Oh, wow. And she doesn't, you don't really taste it. You can't really taste mm. it. It depends on the variety that you use. But I use almost always like sunflower or broccoli or red cabbage. These are really mild flavors. And it adds a huge amount of nutrients, but the child doesn't taste it. And she actually enjoys it. We put it in a smoothie. I'll put the microgreens. I'll put a couple bananas. I'll put some peanut butter powder or just regular peanut butter if you've got it. And then I'll put some frozen blueberries and all those blended up together. It makes a really nice, like nutty, fruity, uh, almost like, like a jam. And what is it? Like a peanut butter and jam sandwich. Yeah. Smoothie. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, sometimes we, she, for a week, she was really into this, like making a bowl of cereal and pouring the smoothie onto the bowl of cereal instead of milk oh, wow. and eating it that way. Yeah. And, and now she's, now she's over that. She, she doesn't want that anymore, but anyway, <laughs> it worked for a little while. And that's also for parents. Yeah. Some things are going to work some days and some days they're not going to work. Yeah. So you just keep trying with whatever you're doing. We keep trying to give them microgreens. Sometimes we might say to them, okay, now you've had this food and you've eaten a piece of that and a piece of that. Now it's time to choose like one of the vegetables. Now you can have a carrot or you can have two microgreens or something like that. And the kid's looking at, oh, like I could have a carrot, which is like a bigger thing. Or I could have just this tiny little microgreen. Yeah. Well, and nutritionally, they're similar. So, yeah. So I don't really care what the kid eats. And the kids yeah. sometimes will eat the microgreens. In the case of my oldest daughter, she'll completely submerge the microgreen in ranch dip before she eats it. <laughs> and she does that with almost any vegetable. She has to have it completely covered with ranch dip. Oh my God. That's, that used to be me. I love ranch so much. I can't eat it now <laughs> because of the sugar, but gotcha. ranch was my jam. Like I would put ranch on yeah. rice and eat it. It was so good. Oh, she does. On, yeah, I everything. She her. would get along with you then. I oh, understand. Okay. It's good to know that. <laughs> It's good to know that our child is not like strange that there no. are other people like that. <laughs> no, but unfortunately, I think because of that, because my dad likes to say this, he's because you had, you had all your limits that li- like you had, you capped out on your sugar levels when you were younger that now you can't like digest sugar or you're like allergic to sugar. So I'm like, I was yeah. just, this is actually what a physician told me one time. She's one gets a certain amount of food 
in their life. Some people choose to eat it all in the beginning of their life. And in the later life, they just have to eat a little bit. Or you can stretch it out throughout the whole. It's really just your decision. That's where it is. So it's like basically how you choose to put your time or put your energy use is that's it. You just get this amount of energy. But yeah, I think we're, we've done really good today. And I'm so happy that people got, oh my gosh, they found out what microgreens are. I surely did. And then we talked about how like they grow, if people wanted to grow them, the nutrients that are in them the different types of things, how to grow them and then how to eat them. My gosh, we literally covered it all here. Yeah. There's so much information out there. Like you can easily find a thousand videos of how to grow microgreens or nutrients in different microgreens or how to cook them. And this is, so this is a great starting point to learn a little bit, but there's so much out there. If people really want to get into it, they just need to go out and look for it. And uh, it's not hard to find. I think also for the moms who are listening, like if they're breastfeeding, I think fenugreek would be like one of the first microgreens that would be great for to boost your like milk supply. And that might be- And also the sunflower microgreens, I can't remember exactly what it was, but one of our family members who's a naturopathic doctor mentioned sunflower microgreens as something that's useful during pregnancy. And fenugreek obviously was also something that is beneficial for for moms- Yeah. And even alfalfa sprouts was another thing that came up and that comes up a lot. People will hear alfalfa sprouts. Yes. However, my mom used to have a lot of sprouts and yeah, the difference between sprouts and microgreens is that with sprouts, you're eating the whole plant, including the root and the seed hull and all of it. And usually it's grown in water the whole time. Mm. And usually it's grown in indirect light. So the chances for certain bacteria like listeria and other things like that, the chances of having those things are much greater mm. with sprouts versus microgreens. Um, so microgreens, you don't eat the, you don't eat the roots. Microgreens are grown in soil. They're mm. grown under light. And so the so I chances think, of having this. So do you are. cut them once the microgreens grow? Like you cut them. Yeah. You don't yeah, pull I them have out. a really sharp knife. I just grab them like I'm grabbing a bunch of hair yeah. and just chop and then toss into a thing that I, when I'm, when I'm done with it, I put them into like packages wow. and package them up. And yeah. I'm so glad we got that last detail in there because I think that was going to be important because I was just going like, to pu- pull out the greens. No, you just use your face. You just yeah. Eat it right off of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Exactly. Um, yeah, you cut it off. If you're growing for yourself, you literally can just chop off what you want to eat and put it into your food. Mm. That's probably the way to get the best nutrition from it possible because you're taking something live and you're eating it within within minutes of when it was harvested. And so it retains all of the nutrients. And that's really the best way to do it. All right. So I'm so happy that we actually got all this. This is so, this is going to be so helpful. And I think for people who are not only as our expert advisor on the YAM podcast with microgreens, but also just like a little bit talking a little bit about your business and things like that. Like this might give like other moms, like some ideas. Cause like one of the reasons, like I didn't share this before in our, when we started the bliss series. And that is like a lot of moms actually come up to me and they talk about after momming for, or being at home with their kids for a couple of years, yeah. they don't, they don't want to go back to their old career or like they've been away for so long and that they've like their identity their senses of identity have changed so drastically that they're also willing and open to like search for new ways and new yeah. things to do. And so I think this bliss series is really there to help like just inspire like different business ideas, things that you could even try at home or things yeah. that you could do that's helpful as a mom, like whether it's remote work or like growing, like literally farming in your garden, farming in your home, essentially. So I hope this was really helpful for people. And I'm sure it is like, I learned a lot. And if you want, you can go to our website, www.yogaavikmod.com 
forward slash the yam podcast. And in the comment section of this episode, you can comment down below like what you learned. I definitely, you'll see my comment there that I'll be like, I didn't know what microgreens were. And yeah, let us know what you learned in the comments below. And if there's anything more that you would like to learn about microgreens, and maybe we can invite Josh back up on the podcast to answer your questions if you like. So I'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye. Hope you guys enjoy that episode and hope you guys learned a little something something to take home with you. My favorite aspect of this podcast is the part where Josh talks about letting microgreens die in order to change their color and become more beautiful and to make their taste even better. Just so amazing how nature provides us with so many examples of resilience. Wow. Oh my gosh, can you imagine like all of our hardships in life? We're all meant for a reason. And nature is our example. We only grow back stronger, guys. Oh, and by the way, you know the soundtrack that you're hearing in the background of this, my voiceover right now? Yeah, like literally this one. Josh Patton made it. Oh my gosh. He is the creator of this. We're super grateful for him. So thank you so much, Josh. We love you here at Yoga Avec Moi. Woohoo! We will see you in the next episode. Yay!